Petongo, you are born Israeli. You are Jewish. You served in the IDF. What is your message and your opinion on what is happening in Gaza? People should actually practice their bravery right now and express their their truth. Welcome to the Light Force Center podcast, Ancient Healing for the New Earth. I'm Shayun. And I'm Alexander Yassin. And here we are on the constant inner quest of truth, questioning everything. Through the process of healing, we are awakening to our life's purpose. And you're gonna find a lot of incredible information here to help you do just that in the links below in the description. And at any time, if you feel inspired, please hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up and leave a comment. Tell us your thoughts about today's episode because it's going to be a powerful one, a powerful one. Today we have a dear, dear brother of ours, Shayun and myself in the Light Force Center. He is born and raised Israeli. He served in the IDF and he ended up devoting his life to activism for peace. On top of that, he is by far one of the most, if not the most, incredible jewelry designers I've ever seen in my life. We've been rocking his jewels for about 10 years. He's a beautiful spirit and a dear brother, and we're going to be asking some very difficult questions and really peeling back the layers to understand both sides of this war and this conflict through the lens of somebody who has lived it and has been raised in it and served in it um, since he was born. So with that being said, welcome, welcome our dear brother, Patango. How are so you? So overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm 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 pretty good. I mean, it's kind of late, but thank you. you know, I'm I'm kind of like a. It's like an after-hour party for me. I know it's <laughs> one a.m. It's past you know? one a.m. in Los Angeles for Patongo, and yeah, we made him stay yeah. up. Thank you, thank you for pulling the late night I shift love for it. us. It's, it's it's super important for me, and I'll I'll have white night if I need it. Aww. All right, well, beautiful brother. Yeah. So, um. To kick things off, you know, why why is it important for you to be here having this conversation? We can just go straight to the point. Let's get I into it. I feel like every every moment that um, we're not putting the words out to stop um, to stop uh, the war. If you want to call it war, to stop the killing of innocent people of both sides, it's a it's a it's a time that we're actually going to regret if we would look back in in history. You know, like if we would go back in history and would look what happened right now, we will regret that we didn't make much more noise at what we actually do. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel a lot of that. Um, a lot of that silence that we hear from people who actually have a voice is uh, come out of fear, you know. A lot of a lot of fear of being rejected from from friends, from you know maybe like people that can offer you jobs, that can offer you opportunities, and a lot of that happening right now. And and therefore, I I feel like people should actually practice their bravery right now and express their their truth this is this is the time you know this is the time where humanity is actually in action and and we should ask yourself all of us what is actually to be a human and i feel like by me being being active in that movement of peace is actually the most uh, practical way for me to 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 be a good human mm. mm -hmm. in this time in this time yeah thank you Beautiful. and can you give us yeah. a little bit of a background on you where you were born um what was well, it like in, what was it like yeah yeah being born was awesome <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I born in Tel Aviv, in Israel, which is basically 
there is almost like two capitals in uh, in Israel. There is Jerusalem that is more like the political capital, and then there is Tel Aviv that is more like the the business capital, and it's it's kind of like they're very different in their energy because uh, Tel Aviv is kind of new, and there is no the heaviness of uh, there is not a lot of the there is not the heaviness of religions there. It's lighter. And then there is Jerusalem that it's it's like you're diving into the past the moment you're coming in. It's very interesting, very very powerful place. So I born I born in Tel Aviv and I loved it there. You know, there is a beautiful it's a beautiful reality. Were you born were you born into a Jewish family? Yes, I born to a Israeli Jewish family. Yeah, absolutely. And would you yeah. and you consider yourself Jewish, correct? Yeah, I mean the the word Jewish it took different different shapes and form for me uh, the last 30 years. Because uh, there was times that I that I didn't want to see myself as as a Jew, you know. Like I I I've been in process with that, but like by blood, yes, I can't run away from that. Like that's who I am. That's 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 never gonna change there. But my perspective and the way I look at Judaism change all the time. It's very organic for me, and it's not coming from a religious perspective. Uh, it's more about culture than religion for me. It's, uh, it's how I grew up, you know, and I, I've, been, I've been shaped by being an Israeli Jew because if I was, a, 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 if I was a, a, from Israel, but I was actually a, a Palestinian who live in Israel, then I would be shaped in a different way. Right. So, so that's what, how that's how it's been, yeah. And so, what was it like culturally growing up um, as a child, as a young adult in Israel? Um, you know, I think it's really important for people for the outside to get a firsthand understanding of what the culture is like because it's hard. There's not a lot coming out of Israel, to be honest, as it relates to um, you know people on the ground expressing you know, their lives and what's really going on. So tell us a bit about that. It's, it's a really interesting place because in one way you have a very new country. So it's immigrants from pretty much from all over the world, from East Europe, uh, West Europe, Africa, West Africa, North Africa, Middle East, and they all came there to be protected, in a sense, because, you know, after the program, which happened, you know, in the late 800 to the 900, and then that was in East, East Europe, you know, and then running away, and some of them ran away to, to, to the West, you know, to, to Germany and, and England, and to have the Holocaust. So, so everything was made in a way that Israel would be the escape place. So, you know, uh, we can just dive in into the Zionism, for example, you know. Mm -hmm. So the Zionism, in, in my perspective, in the beginning was a really beautiful movement. Like it's a movement that actually saved a lot of people. Like some from, from, what what I learned, like around 400,000 people been saved by that movement. And then later on, what happened with that movement is a different story. But growing up, I go back to the question. Yeah. So going, so growing up in a, in a, in a country of um, a new country that based on, on, on security, because we all been traumatized, not necessarily me, but my grandparents and, and sometimes 
parent being traumatized by a very strong experience, it's a, and then you, and then there is like a supposedly democracy too, and supposedly it's Jewish too, and it's based on Judaism too. So it's kind of like a conflict and, and not necessarily conflict, but integration of, of, of lots of stuff and lots of cultures. So like, for example, you have the Moroccan Jews, they are, their culture is completely different than the, than the East European Jews. And it's really interesting and it could be rich. And in some places it's very, very rich. But there is also some, you know, at least in the beginning, there was a lot of racism too between the East European and the North African Jews. You know, mm. there was like a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of that too. And then later on, the Ethiopians and the Russian arrived and, and it, so, it wasn't easy. You so if you're, if you're a Jew, no, no, no two Jews are created equal. Is that kind of what I'm getting? Is that like many different cultures <laughs> who are racist within their own cultures, like that exists within? It? There is conflict, you know, there is conflict that they're coming from mostly from, from politics. Mm from the politics in Israel that is complicated, you know, because there is the rabbis that they are in the government. And there is a question, for example, who is a Jew, you know? So like when the Ethiopians wanted to come to, to Israel, there was some issues with them claiming to be Jews. You know, there was like, there was a question, who is a Jew? Mm -hmm. And suddenly the rabbis were like putting some, some difficulties for the Ethiopians to, to come to Israel and, and immigrant and didn't give them the same condition that they gave to the East European. And, uh, and it was kind of, kind of obvious to everybody, but, but then it was also beautiful. Like there was, I think it was one of the most beautiful. I myself, I already left Israel when the Ethiopians uh, immigration came to Israel. So, but I just saw it from the outside and every time I used to come to visit, it was always so beautiful to see that that culture is only there. So that, you know, there is a lot of beauty, and the, the beauty is in the is in the food. For example, you can see like so many different kind of food, and and it's it's a very fun, you know. If and and that's kind of the conflict because it's a very fun place to be in because it's a new country with a very old story, and you can feel the story. Mm -hmm. And in the same time that you can feel the story, you can also feel, especially as a, as a foreigner, like if you would come as a tourist, there would be a point that you would feel the conflict. Yeah. So there would be a point where you would be like, if you would invest a little bit in, in staying enough time and, and dare to not to speak only with the Jews, to start to speak with the Muslims or, or the Christians who live there or go to East Jerusalem into the markets and start to go into the coffee places and, and sit with the local people, with the Palestinians that been there for many, many, many generations and experience the, the, you know, the Turkish empire and then, you know, then the British empire and then the Israeli occupation. So those people, they have a lot of stories too. And when you hear their perspective, a lot of, a lot of things will be maybe even less clear, you know, because suddenly you would have a lot of questions to ask. Because if you're just in Israel, there is no more, there is not a lot of question to ask, you know, there's just the beach, you know, the parties, you know, there is a very strong, uh, uh, you know, uh, nightlife in Israel. There is a lot of parties. There is kind of like a, a little burn, a little burning man that's happening once a year. You know, there's, it's a very interesting, beautiful, uh, beautiful people. And then you go to, and then you go to to East Jerusalem, for example, like to places where you can go because there is some places that you can't go, right? 
So when you're still in the border of Israel, then you go to East, East Jerusalem and then you see the, the, the Arabic culture, the Palestinian culture. You're like, wow, that's so rich. And that's so ancient. And uh, like, for example, for me, I only discovered it later on in, in life when I used to come to visit in Israel. And my partners were, you know, with my partners, they were always not Israeli and not Jews. And I would go to East, East Jerusalem and I would experience East Jerusalem from their eyes. And a lot of time people, you know, the local didn't know that I'm Israeli. And it was really beautiful to experience it through that. I almost felt like a spy in a way, you know, like I was like, oh my God, I don't want to get, I don't want them to know that I'm Israel because then everything would change, mm -hmm. which is true, you know, because when I would say that I'm Israel, then things did change, you know, because how do they change? Because we have history, of course. Like we have history. We have a we have a lot of pain. Yeah. <clears throat> we have a lot of pain that that um, a lot of pain that the Israeli side doesn't really want to see, mm. and the Palestinian side they just see it all the time. Mm. You know, it's so, still you know it's still very fresh. This is so important because I, I, one of the things I really want to personally understand is the psychology behind the Israeli. Jews and it seems that it's quite fragmented. On one hand, I see currently rabbis in Israel standing up for um, for peace and and getting completely beaten by IDF soldiers. On the other hand, you've got this nationalist Zionist perspective that um, seems to justify you know the murder and killing of innocent people at all costs and self defense. And like you said, doesn't want to look at certain things um, that the other side, Palestinians, are seeing every single day. I want, and I don't want to do a history lesson, but but I really want to understand oh, like good, your your I'm not good like that. Yeah, I want to understand your perspective as it goes back because it seems like there is this, um, and I say this with as much sensitivity as could possibly be allowed, an entitlement that exists within the, the Israeli Jewish community that claims that Israel is their birthright as chosen people of God. And that goes back to the dawn of, of time almost. But yet when you study history, you see that it's not only the, the, that one culture, right? The Palestinian people and what became Arabic cultures, they've all coexisted since the beginning back there. So where do you yeah. feel or think that that comes from and am I articulating it right or just judging? You know, there is this, like again, the Zionist movement, you know, it's all started with a really, maybe at least from where I'm looking at it, probably came from uh, innocent uh, innocent thoughts, a collective thoughts of saving the Jews, right? Now, Israel, you know, the Jews, you know, they were like in, in until the, the, the end of 1800, there was very small percentage of Jews in actually in Palestine. You know, it was between two to 5%. Mm -hmm. And, People argue about the percentage exactly, you know, and, and and we would never really know, right? But like, so, but when the program happened, so so there was a movement. And honestly, from 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 both sides, you hear great stories about the connection between the 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 Jews and the Muslims and the Christians, while they had uh, the British there. Or, or while they had the Turkish there, you know, the, the, when they were not, because let's face it, the Palestinians didn't have a country and the, and the Jews didn't have a country. They were controlled, they were occupied, mm -hmm. both of them, mm -hmm. by another regime, you know, and, and it keeps shifting and changing all right, the time. Right, it was the Romans you know, from, in from, Jesus' from, time, for example, right? The it's Greeks, always yeah, been. like it was, yeah, so, and... 
you know, they, they were always, both of them, they were always second class citizens. Mm -hmm. So when, when the Jews in the beginning came, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad, you know, when, when the Jews came in the beginning and it was not clear to everybody that the Jews would have a country. It wasn't that clear, you know, it was the, we, you know, the, we just ran away from Europe, you know, it was before we came, you know, from Iran and from Iraq and from, you know, Morocco and Algeria, it, it was, it was the beginning. And, and if you even think about it, like they came from another environment, you know, they, they came from East Europe, like, how do you even work the ground? How do you build houses? Like, how do you do all those things that for the locals were, were, were obvious? So there was a lot of help from the locals to the new immigrants, you know? So there was not immediately like, you know, that, that fire. And I think the fire came, and, and I might be wrong here and there, you know, but I'm sure like conflicts can happen, but. I really believe that the fire came, you know, like around 1913, you know, 1915, that suddenly there, you can see the Zionist intention to actually create a Jewish country. And, and, it, was, and it was a problem because the British promised to, to the Palestinians their own country, which they were Muslim. So Muslims and Christians. So now... I grew up as a as an Israeli Jew, and I've been educated that when I came, like in school, that when I came to when, when our grandparents came to Israel, we brought life to the desert. So we didn't learn about about the Palestinian culture or how many villages were there, or we we didn't learn their history in a way that we knew that they were there. Mm. We kind of like, yeah, there was some, there was, you know, but then they ran away, you know, like it was very like sugarcoating mm -hmm. on a reality that was actually, you know how they said it, the winner, right? You know, all the winners of the wars running the history, you know? So, you know, obviously Israel was winning the wars and, and I born, after the war, so here I am, you know, come to a reality which is, you know, we win the wars, but they tried to attack us, and, you know, we were kind of like, we're the small ones, you know, all of them, they are, you know, like, they could go to other places, you know, we didn't give attention to, to, to the similarity between the Palestinians and the Jews. Mm. There was not really uh, there was not really attention of how similar we are because we both been chased we we both been rejected by, they were rejected by the Jordanian by the Syrian you know like we both were like not really popular and that's really important to know you know because until today until today Palestinians are not really popular in in other Arab countries that's why they don't really accept them so easily to as a refugees. And so being born to this reality, it's kind of like an, and knowing that we had the right to be there without making the search too much, if it's true or not, mm. put you in a place that w when you arrive, you know, <laughs> you, you know that you would go to the army in, in one point and you know that you have enemies. Was it required for and you to, to join the army? Yeah, yeah. It's mandatory. Yeah, everybody, it's mandatory. everybody goes to the army. No, mandatory. Yeah, no, not everybody has to be a fighter. You know, there is like many, many jobs in the army. You know, you can be a cook. You can be in office. You can, you, you know, and, and back in my time, women were not really in battle, fighting in battles. Now, now I think it's kind of changed. And you served um, from what year to what year? I joined the I joined the military when I was uh, uh, in 1988. So you joined that May 1988. So you joined the IDF in 1988, and you served for three years. Correct? Yeah, yeah. In Gaza and yeah, Lebanon. I, I first uh, served in Lebanon, and 
experienced um I had like very strong experiences there. Mm-hmm. And and you were in combat? And it was yeah, but but it was with with soldiers, you know. And it was like it it was kind of like what we've been trained to. Mm-hmm. You know, we've been trained to to fight a war, you know, to fight against soldiers. And even even though I I'll carry any kind of pain of fighting and it's all been very strong for me and 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 very traumatic in many ways because you know fighting in fighting in in bile is is not is not made for no one mm. like that's what i think so mm. but but that but then after lebanon the first after I've been in Lebanon, the, the first intifada, I, I remember I was in a, I was in a course to become a commander, commander of a tank, and they they call us because the first intifada started, and the first intifada, I think intifada is Arabic, is like taking the camel out of my back or something like that, you know, it's like, you know, you know, I, I, honestly, like we we didn't know much about. Like in my unit, for example, we didn't know much about Palestinians' life or anything like that, and suddenly, and we never been in Palestine, obviously. Mm. And and then we arrive, you know. They took us to, you know, they guide us a little bit. They tell us it was very, very like there. There was very strong violent fear energy in the air before we went in it's it's felt very tense you know like you knew you're going you're coming into something very strong and we basically like going into gaza excuse me and and you basically feel like you're going to hell immediately it's like the energy is very intense like you know you know you're not in your place and and as as you know you as a soldier you know maybe you want to prove to your country and to your family uh, you know that you you know you're a hero you're there but you don't put together it you actually need an enemy for that Mm. and there is no face for an enemy you know, and I mean, usually some, you know, you have to, it's have to be created. Like you can't artificially say, this is your enemy and, and then I'm angry. You know, it doesn't work that way. So w- when I, when, when I, I can always speak about my experience. When I arrived to Gaza and to, and to the streets of, first of all, the streets of Gaza, they're all very small and, and, and it's, it's a refugee camp, like basically, you know, especially back then. And, it's it's another world it's like it's it's the poorest environment that you can imagine yeah it's inhumane especially coming from tel aviv right right i mean it's so been I'm going it's been called, and, and, it's been called a, like the largest outdoor concentration camp would would you agree yeah to that statement i never been in a concentration camp i can't tell you you know that's one thing that i do believe that it's would remind people if people would experience life in the ghetto it might be they might be able to make the connection i never been like you know i I never been in the holocaust i don't know how it's felt i know that the holocaust was the worst thing that could happen to the jews and i do believe that yeah, I, I, I can't say that it's a concentration camp. You know, I can say that it's occupied land that look that people live there under terrible condition, and they're they definitely don't get what they need to have proper yeah. proper life, and they definitely don't get what Israeli gets. There is 
hundred percent. Even saying, you know, I, I feel like uh, a lot of the problems that are here in this conflict are the words themselves. So mm-hmm. people say apartheid. Oh, it's not apartheid. Oh, uh, concentrate. It's not a con- It's, you know, like I feel that people using those words actually what it does, and I myself guilty in that, what, what we do is actually we create a co- uh, conflict between, you know, like now there is a definition and instead of to speak about the reality that we created, the Israeli created a terrible condition of living to the Palestinians, instead of to speak about this, we start to speak, is that apartheid mm. or is that this? You know, so many words like masker, what is masker? Is that a masker? Yes, it's masker. We are killing innocent people right now. Is that a masker? Is that, is it matter or What's matter is that we're killing innocent people. Are we losing our hu- humanity? Is that is that matter? What name we call it? And that's the most important thing. And mm-hmm. I think the whole conflict is not conflict of words. It's conflict. It's 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 just we have to make a decision in what side of history we're standing by, you know? Absolutely. If we're neutral, then the, the killing will continue because a strong Israel, honestly, I can tell you, a strong Israel will not make peace. Guarantee. Mm. There is no reason. Why would you make peace if somebody is not powerful? Mm. Right? Right. Mm. And even if you would make peace, what kind of peace it would look like? So the only options that that right now there is, is actually very strong criticizing of Israel by Jews themselves, you know? And wow. wow. That's and a that's, strong point. And this is a strong point. There's two things that were so important. And thank you for sharing that, brother, because I feel your heart is you were getting into a very important piece about you serving and what that was like when you first kind of went into Palestine and the con- and the conditions. And now you're also talking about a very important point about actually Jewish people standing up. Um, and I know that you've probably been called a traitor and, and I've seen other Jewish friends of mine who are standing for peace and, sta- and criticize who are being, you know, attacked by their own people and losing family and friends. So I can't imagine that that is an easy stance for you to take either. Um, let's speak to the first part is you're coming in, you're coming in there for, as your first operation into Gaza. You're seeing this, this experience. You're talking about putting a face to an en- enemy because you can't just be angry you know, out of nowhere. What was the most Im- impactful moment for you when you were serving in Gaza? There was few, but one of the strongest moments for me was a, a really good friend of mine that we served for more than a year together. You know, like when you're in, in service in the army as a fighter, the connection between people is, is is so powerful, you know. Like you, you sleep two hours a, a, a night if, and uh, you are hallucinating from from tiredness so many times, and it's all very very vulnerable all the time, like all the time vulnerable. And one of my best friends there, that he was the most innocent, beautiful person. There was one night that we were uh, we had to take out citizens out of their house because there was a graffiti against the occupation. And we went and we got a, our commander told us, we have to take out the people who live in this house and they have to clean the graffiti, the graffiti out of, you know, right now in the middle, they have to clean. And I remember, you know, you knock on the door really strong, you know, and, tah, 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 and it's all, it's all very, very bad very very bad and and just for graffiti you know like who care you know but like it's just showing who is the boss you know and that's what i don't like like gangster mentality for no reason you know and then like you knock on the door and and obviously the people who open the door will not be the teenagers or or the young adult because they probably will get beaten stronger you know 
So it's the old men that come and, you know, like I saw my friend treat the way I saw my, my best friend treating this old man made me to realize that I lost something. Mm. Seeing him made me to realize that I lost something. And I think this is when my process of, uh, of understanding where I'm standing in all that started. What happened you to know, that suddenly man? I re- what did he do? I honestly, I, I don't really remember. You know, it was all so intense and, and there was a moment where I was like, I was not able to see. You know, I was not able to, to feel, I was not able to see. I shut down, you know, it's happened to me a few times in my life, you know, when something really strong, something really that doesn't, doesn't make sense in my uh, emotional intelligence, I, I kind of like turn off, you know, so it's kind of, it's kind of where I was, but just the idea mm-hmm. and the details are really not important. I actually, until today, I, I don't care about the details of the suffering, you know, how much suffering. I, I care about if, if we create suffering intentionally, then we should be judged by that and criticized by, by, by our own people first. Mm. Like, uh, and, and, you know, obviously the Hamas have to be criticized by, by, by the Muslim community as well. You yeah. know, they're, they're, they shouldn't be a blind support for the Hamas, you know. Mm-hmm should be support for resistance 100% but not for extreme resistance you know from my perspective because i'm against violent mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i'm against killing innocent people in all sides mm-hmm. like i'm not peak side like it's not like here you can kill i understand that resistance is really important and peace will not happen without resistance but i feel yeah, uh, probably can be, probably the the Palestinian, maybe. I, it's so hard because I'm not a Palestinian. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I was just asking, me, like, so many times I put myself in the shoes of Palestinians just to understand their perspective and having really good friends, Palestinians now in America. And every time I put myself in their shoes, I see myself as, as, no way I'm going to arrive to 54 years old with the personality that I have. There is no way. I will I, I rebel against the biggest, con- like medium class Israeli environment. I rebel against that. So I wouldn't rebel against being in occupied territory? Of course I will. Of course you will. Of course all my friends that now against, uh, they, that would call me a traitor, of course, all of them will be resisting the Israeli occupation if they were Palestinians. hundred percent. Right. Like, I have no doubt. So, so that's P- where we are. Patongo, you are born Israeli. You are Jewish. You served in the IDF. What is your message and your opinion on what is happening in Gaza? Because you were one of the first people and one of my friends who made me so proud to see that. Actually, you tell it. What is your message? My message that if we, if, if, if the Zionist movement came to create safety to the Jews, then 100% this safety have to go to the Palestinians as well. Because without safety to the Palestinians, there is no safety to the Jews point. There is no way that it's one-sided safety to one side. It's just not, it's not going to happen. And how to make peace, this is not, this is not my job. Like I, I, I have a lot of ideas, but they're not important right now. The most important is to do ceasefire right now, to see the damage that's been done, to, to feel the pain, and through that pain to understand what's not to do. And both sides, right? But like, first of all, ceasefire right now. Move those warmongers that just constantly put 
poison and division between the people. Palestinians don't hate Israelis. Israelis, most, most Palestinians don't hate Israelis. Most Israelis don't hate Palestinians, point. We living each other culture. We eating, we eating the same food. We breaking bread, you know. We have to understand this is only politics. This is only, you know, we 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 dealing with with uh, with people who re like with governments of, you know, and leaders of both sides that really love friction. They, they, they're needed, you know, as long as there is friction and division, they're needed. The moment yeah. there is peace, they're not needed anymore. Yes, and thank you. You know, it's it's a bunch of narcissism, you know, like it's just narcissists that really want to be recognized, want to be leaders, mm -hmm. you know, like good people. They don't want to be leaders. They just want to have good life, simple life, to be good humans. Mm -hmm. You know, you, right? you said such an important point when you were talking about your experience and in, in going into Gaza is that you need an enemy, right? F for war. Yeah. You need an enemy. Um, you need an it, enemy. It seems on the governmental level, and you see this with every single war, that by and large, that enemy is either created, funded by the opposition and then attacked that, or, or set up to create this narrative so that it could justify these attacks. Um, you know, and, and nothing justifies, again, like the murdering of innocent people, like October the 7th, nothing. or like what's going on now. Um, but it, it almost seems like Netanyahu needs Hamas in order to justify the conquering of Gaza. And, and they say it's self-defense. I really want to understand from your perspective, when you were serving in Gaza, and the veil was, I, I, I put you, you know, these words to it, lifted from your face. Was the energy in the command and the directive to just simply eliminate terrorists, or was there clearly an agenda to take over land and push people out of their homes? Yes or no? That would be, that would be, you know, again, that would be opinions. And that would be like one yeah, your truth opinion. of one person. Your, your opinion be, through your my, experience. My opinion, my opinion from my experience, there is no justice. Uh, we don't learn justice to the Palestinians. We don't learn their history. We don't learn their culture. Maybe later on we do, but like as, as, you know, as education, we don't. Even now in the news, if you go to the Israeli news, it's always about the hostages. It's always, it's never really showing you what's happening in Gaza, like really the suffering of the people. They never show the suffering of the Palestinian people. And the problem is that people like us who live in Israel, they don't know 10% of what we know about what's happening in Gaza. Really? Why is that? So Programming. Because... It's 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 the power of media, you know. Like we know that, you know. So this so is, so people. This is how, like like you, you mentioned your your parents and your family is there, and they don't know what's happening in Gaza, right? They they think they know because you know they think they could trust the few channels that there is. Uh, you know, there is left side. There is the it don't, there is a newspaper called ah Aharitz, which is a, uh, which. Is, one of the people who write there is uh, Gidon Levy, which is an incredible person. And Gidon Levy is writing a lot of powerful stuff that people have to deal with, but not a lot of people really even listening to him. So there is, there is the voice of, of reason. There is a voice of, of uh, sanity. But, like, but who want to listen when you're just projecting fear all the time and constantly putting the videos of, of what's happened in the seven, which was terrible, mm. but you can't, you can't keep putting us like, like the Holocaust and, and the, now the seven, you know, constantly to put us those nightmares. So, so we live under fear constantly. Mm -hmm. And when we live under fear, our decisions that we make are wrong decisions always. Cause I, we're always pretending like we're like barely survived. Right. I, I really like genuinely want to understand as much as possible, like the mindset of the individual who is, is born and raised in Israel or, or not. Right. And, and will only see that one side of the narrative. Right. 
and completely disregard mm. the other side, right? Like Dr. Gabor Mate, an incredible human being, often says like we have to we have to acknowledge our own suffering, but we have to acknowledge the other as well. So so is it is yeah. it programming that is keeping people like unaware, or is it just a choice? Or, it's absolutely program, and even when I say to people, you know, it's program, and then it's also we have to remember that the other side been suffering for so long and been denied for so long, and a lot of the good leaders of them got got to go to jail, you know, like became or been killed or you know, like in a sense, in a way, having aggressive leaders in Palestine actually make sense to to Bibi and other warmongers like him. So in a sense, having, you know, growing up, uh, I mean, I can't say growing up the Hamas because Hamas is, have his own path, you know, but like supporting a strong Hamas in a way, it's actually very healthy to Israel because it's creating an endless conflict and therefore there will never be peace. So what you say is kind of true, but that's only my perspective. I know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I just say my opinion, mm -hmm. my perspective. You know, there will be like a, a thousand people sitting on this chair and thousand people will say their own opinion. This is my perspective, seeing the big picture. This is how I see it. Mm -hmm. And this is how I feel that pain of uh, the vision between those two people, and, and the, the most crazy thing that, uh, at least in my perspective, I feel like that a lot of those Palestinians are people that been Jews before. Because those people living on this land for, for, you know, for thousands of years or whatever, a lot of them probably been Jews. We're, we're like, uh, Jews would, you know, American Jews would tell me, we are the this and we're, I'm like, yo, I have a better connection, natural connection with a Palestinian than with American Jew. When you say we, what do you mean? I, I have a, a stronger we with a Palestinian than we have with American Jew. Why is that? Because we have similar culture. Mm. Mm. We, we, have, we have connection to the land, you know? I don't have, you know, like American Jew, like, you know, we, we don't have that, well, you know? You know, like... That's been lost then, you know, clearly through this whole divisive plan. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe this is maybe this is what will bring the world to know and bring you guys and other people like you to actually spread the words. And I'm so grateful that you do that. Mm. Oh, great. And you. yeah, and, and just... And just make this, you know, bring back the power to the, bring back. I don't even know if bring back, bring power to the people, acknowledging the power of, of the people. You know, we have a certain kind of needs. We need peace mm. because in peace, we flourish. Like in peace, we, we have, uh, we have suddenly, you know, when we have peace, we have suddenly money to, to have, to have a free education, to have, to, to be, to have free Healthcare. To, we're in mm -hmm. fact, we're in paradise when when we're in peace. Mm -hmm. When we're in peace, without fear of war. You mm -hmm. know, when the world understands that peace is a better path. And mm -hmm. I think right now, the world. And I don't want to see, uh, you know, like yes, there is jihad. Yes, there is extremists in every place. There is extremists in the Jews, and there is extremists in the Muslims. But I'm not talking about like you know, if the world conscious will drive. To peace, I don't know why I'm doing this hand thing. <laughs> <laughs> Make your point. But you can't, you can't have peace yeah. without freedom, can you? And then that's yeah, and that's without the key. equalities. Yeah, we you can't have peace without equalities. All right, so we can't have peace without freedom, and you said we can't have peace without equality, and I thought that was really poignant, brother. So as we wrap this up, what is your what is your message? to your Jewish brothers and sisters? First of all, I feel like every Israeli, every Jew should concentrate maybe five minutes a day to put themselves 
in the reality of the Palestinians right now. That's uh, really important. Just to feel how it is to be right now Palestinian will be will be very helpful because uh, they have terrible reality right now, and it's uncomparable to the reality of of the Israelis, and that's a fact. And then Israel must remember that peace you make with your enemy. You can't make peace with anybody else. So all all the Israelis say, oh, you can't make peace with the Hamas. You can't. You only can make peace with your worst enemy. That's that's who you make peace with. And <laughs> right, you don't you don't make no. peace with the people you're peaceful and with. And I have billions of messages that I totally forgot because I'm very, you know, I'm I'm obviously very emotional and and. You know, I, I just, I just want those. You know, I just want before I die, I want to see Palestine and, and uh, Israel having an amazing, like, and because our connection is so beautiful, and and when there is this connection, we 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 we're such mm-hmm. a good, we're we're just so good together, you know, and and everybody know that, yeah. you know, every, you know, it's just so simple, you know. And not letting anything that tell you this complicated, not let it just uh, no, thank you. I don't want to see your point of view of complication. This is not necessarily for me. I want to see it simple. I want to vision it simple mm-hmm. and I want to keep it simple because peace is much more simple than war. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love, oh. thank you for those messages, brother. And we're so grateful for you coming yeah. here and sharing thank your you heart with us. And I know, I mean, I can't even imagine it, it must be very difficult. And I'm, I know that this is going to help a lot of people. And thank you, everybody yeah. who's, who's listened to the end. Please subscribe and leave your comments below. Keep love them respectful, you, please. And um, also, you've got to check out Patongo's work um, because he, he's an absolute <laughs> brilliant legend in, in creativity and the, and the way in which you create your your jewelry and your pieces really connects with the spirit and the new and, and the new piece he's wearing right now with the olive branch um, <laughs> i need that <laughs> so, in gold <laughs> yeah in gold so we'll put we'll put your thank links so in the much. descriptions below and I really thank you so much you thank you for staying up i love you